We are underway. You're good to go. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin. And once again, welcome to the Digital Rebar Online Meetup. This is Meetup version 009. And today we're going to talk a little bit about enhanced logging. We're going to get a demo from Victor. And we're going to talk about ISOLES installs. And once again, we're going to put Victor back up on the uh, deck to uh, in the hot seat to uh, demo the ISOLES install process as well. As always, we'll talk about release planning and community feedback. Uh, we've got a nice crowd in today. Uh, we've got uh, from the Rackin team, we've got the usual uh, crazy kooky Rackin coders. Uh, we've got Rob Hirschfeld Actual. And we've got Steven Spector. We've got Victor Loudon. We've got Greg Althaus and, of course, myself. Uh, on the community, well, we seem to have a nice uh, uh, fill out of some new members joining us, Stan Chan, uh, Romaine LaFontaine, and some of our old standby, Chris Trees and Will Dennis. Welcome, everybody. Hope your new year has been going well. And uh, for those of you that just didn't see, I just recently posted in the uh, community chat Slack channel the agenda link for today. Uh, if anyone wants to jump in and take a look at that while we're editing. Uh, last time on Digital Rebar Meetup, we talked about uh, release planning. We did some enhanced logging discussion, which is leading up to today's demo and final changes. We had a, a whole lot of UI tweaks going in. And I suspect actually um, along the UI tweaks uh, side of things, we have a bunch that's happened in the last couple of weeks recently too. We'll have uh, Rob Hirschfeld kick off and talk a little bit about some of the things we've done recently on the UI side of things. I'll be ready. Awesome. I put him in the hot seat. He didn't know we were going to talk about it. <laughs> All right. So, um, Victor, why don't we turn over to you and uh, you kind of get a large majority of the today's time. Uh, let's talk a little bit first about the enhanced logging. If you want to sort of tee up a little bit about um, what the change specifically we were looking to accomplish, uh, what we did accomplish, and how it can be used for the betterment of mankind, and then also show us your fancy demo. Ooh, a demo. I don't know about that demo part. Let me get my screen. Sh oh, someone stopped sharing so I can share. Because you want all, to right. all this new all shiny. Right. Canvas. All yours, bud. OK. All right, can you all see my screen? Not yet. Not yet? No. No. Okay, let's try this. Negatory, good buddy. Your screen. I keep seeing Will. Your screen. Just Will's palm. And, and no one wants to see that. <laughs> okay, how yes. about that better? Much. All righty. Okay, <clears throat> so one of the enhancements that we have uh, made to logging um, comes in a few different parts. Uh, First part, you'll notice the screen that I'm on where the it's the info and preferences screen. The logs now have words instead of numbers so you can figure out uh, what the various logging levels are. And they go all the way from trace, which is uh, really intended for uh, whenever we need a whole lot of information to troubleshoot an issue, to debug, which are you know basic debug messages. Uh, info, which will, you know, our logs for anything that uh, is informational, but not nece necessarily something you need to worry about. Uh, Warren, for stuff that you probably should worry about, but that isn't uh, going to necessarily interfere with uh, the correctness of the system, and error for errors when things are all uh, going to explode. Settable. So, so, hey, yeah. Victor, question. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Part, the, the naming isn't necessarily in order of severity or uh, it is in fact in order of severity trace is the least severe and error is the most severe here okay right. so, yeah that, that is in order of severity I, I would have reversed warn and error there in my head but uh well warn is for stuff that you uh it's not necessarily going to interfere with the correctness of the system uh it's like you have a competing dhcp server that's out there and we've detected it that gets yep. admitted as warn but it's okay. not going to interfere with the operation of our DHCP server in the sense that uh, 
our DHCP server will still operate correctly when it gets to the packets first. Right. Hey, hey Victor. Mm -hmm. We when we were putting together icons for this, there were two other levels that I think you can't turn off, which are there's a, like a panic level, and um, there was another like a fatal, fatal yeah. catch fire, catch fire and die basically. Yeah. Uh, those don't show up in the UX because you can't. Um, those log levels have consequences. Uh, fatal will uh, emit the log message and then terminate the system, and okay. we'll do the same thing except with a stack trace. Hmm. So, Good. Yeah. yeah, but we only allow you to dial the uh, the severity of log messages that will ignore down to error because everything else above that. Um, <laughs> you really need to know. Pay attention to it. Uh, <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's how all this stuff works. And let's see if this breaks screen sharing. Can you still see my screen? Is it just we Firefox do. or my terminals? Terminals. Terminals. Yay, that worked. Okay. So let's see. Uh, Victor, if you could increase your font yeah, size yeah, yeah. a bit, please. Thank you, sir. Okay. So how does all this work? So we've got, we have a few new commands in the CLI. The first one that's you watch the logs that are coming in as they come in. So And I'll flip back to the other screens and I'll click on a button. And we emitted log events. Um, the ones that we've emitted so far are just uh, audit events that say that uh, Rocket Skates um, was here. So we, uh, we have another log level that uh, doesn't show up in the UX called audit, which whose intended use is for um, auditing purposes, basically. Who, you know, per, you know, authenticated user X did Y at Z time. Um, we're still trying to figure out the best places to put those log messages and improve their content. As you can see, this doesn't tell you uh, this tells you that someone authenticated and when they authenticated, but it doesn't tell you what they did. So I need to, we need to figure out the best pattern for having that in there. Um, it can also be a bit spammy. Yeah, I got something. Because every uh, UX, every API interaction will generate uh, one of these uh, audit events. And we, we're, you know, there, there, there are ways that we're trying to uh, trim that down. Um, so the second log command is a derp CLI logs get. And this gets the last uh, thousand or up to a thousand uh, log events that, uh, that the DR provision server has emitted. And you can see that, uh, hey, the first error message that I got was a TFTP transfer error because uh, of something or other. Authenticated general, authenticated uh, something on someone authenticated using a token, lots of audit stuff. And that's pretty much it because I just restarted the service not too long ago. Um, so the way that works is the logging, the uh, logging package uh, that I wrote uh, about a week and a half ago now um, has a dedicated ring buffer for storing the last uh, thousand log messages. Um, that number is configurable and we will eventually expose how many log messages it'll buffer in memory at any, at any given time, probably as a preference, um, but we haven't done that now. Um, so for debugging purposes, if you want to see what, uh, what has happened, you can uh, run derp CLI logs git and it will get the last up to uh, 1000 messages that have been uh, buffered by the system. And that is, and, uh, I'll show you that again after we do bits of the other demo, which is uh, how to install or how to, uh, which is to show off our uh, new uh, ISOless uh, uh, sledgehammer and install routines. Um, this logging integrates with the normal logs. Let's see, I've got a next term here somewhere. And this is just uh, me watching the log output from um, me or me watching the log output from hey, Victor. Yeah. Um, is is there? It's probably a simple question. Uh, hopefully, a simple answer. Is there a way to get this to go to Syslog? 
Um, but, not as such. Uh, the error messages right now are printed out on standard error, and we kind of assume that uh, all the world is a system D for now. And so it's... that goes, I, 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 for instance, oh, I, I get, yeah, I get, yeah, I get, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and we'll also, um, some of the, the advanced features that we'll be adding is plugins to be able to do additional things with logging. So integrations with something like Splunk, Syslog, and Elk Stack, those become uh, feature add-on capabilities. And in addition to the basic raw logging capabilities that Victor's showing us here. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I'd like to get in the Splunk. Yeah, so like, uh, Yeah, when I'm running DR provision on my system, I always just run it as I always install it as a, a system unit. A system D, and it goes. And I run it as a system D thing, and so system D handles all of my log rotation and all that stuff via its journal system. Got it. Yeah, and it's nice that way because all the daemon has to do is write stuff on standard out and standard error, and system D takes care of it from there. It, right. All right. Cool. So. It it is. I don't want to. I don't want to jump ahead in your demo. Um, if you're going to talk about how events can be forwarded, so. Um, yes, so I can actually talk about that real quick. So the first uh, derp CLI logs command that I ran, derp CLI logs watch. Um, all that does is it subscribes to log events that uh, we have the, that uh, DR provision will emit on demand. So um, if you want to have something that uh, listens for log events, you just uh, you can use derp CLI logs watch to grab those. Or using the API, you can just subscribe to the uh, logs.star.star .star .star event stream, and that'll get you all the logs uh, that are currently configured to be emitted. Uh, Victor, is that emitted in WebSockets? Yeah, it's a WebSocket thing. It's a, all, all, all of our event stuff happens over WebSockets. Um, but you know that's an implementation detail that you don't necessarily have to care about unless you're writing a, an API or a client-side API. Don't, don't the plugins also get all the events? They do. So you could have a plugin that would forward basically log messages somewhere else, like a log stash or? Right. Yep, and that's that's the path we go down to implement uh, talking to your Splunk or your log stash or your data dog or your whatever, possibly even your systemd, or not not systemd but uh, syslog or rsyslog, whichever one you prefer. Right. So then, so the JSON the JSON format lets you then sort of pick out the data you want or massage it into whatever format. It's a good intermediate. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. That makes sense. All right, and that's more or less it for the logs demo at this point. I'll just leave this uh, listener running. So any other questions from community around the new enhancements for uh, logging? Uh, I think it's a really important piece for moving the product forward into a more sort of capable operator space. Um, any questions or feedback would be greatly appreciated. Right. Hey. Go ahead. No, go well. I, 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 already know. Uh, I love to see, I guess, because we're in this phase of rapid development on the UX, is to have like some kind of UX logging. I still, I still, when I press buttons and they don't do anything, I would love to see what the system's doing under the hood with the calls. And I know, uh, Rob, you said like, oh, you just use the Chrome network view. Um, that's, I'm not sure that's in like every browser. Um, Rob, did you close any of the, um, developer tools for that? And it, it's more like, it's more like trying to debug the UX, you know? Oh, well. Yeah. So there's, 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 two, there's two parts to that question. <laughs> yeah. So scroll, Victor, scroll, scroll down a little bit to answer the first part, all the way down to endpoint admin, I, which I can't see. It's off your screen. Uh, which one do you want, users or log out? Oh, uh, you don't have the latest uh, UX change then. Or it's not recognizing. Um, There's logs. Is that what you're looking you for? That's what I, I, it's off your screen. I can't see it from here. How about that? Oh, is that it? That's new. 
That's cool. Is that so just UX, Rob? That is in the, it's in the UX. You it's have to have, to, it, it's, that is brand new as of, I think it merged last night uh, so that we could help showcase it for the demo. And then it will show the last thousand log items on a rotating basis. And when new items come in, they will come in at the top. So you will always, you, it, it, this is a live updating view. Um, and it detects whether or not you have the feature flag. So it won't, you won't get, you won't be able to use this view if you don't have a, an endpoint that has the um, new log f flag enabled. Right. Um, it, but yes. It'll be a three, six thing. Uh, that's a great question. Okay. Um, I'm running speed. out the, I'm running on tip, so it'll probably be in three, six. It'll be in three, six. Yeah. Um, so that's one. And then the, the network, the, Will, your, your question about watching network calls and what API calls are taking place. Um, uh, the, that is something like, really where the Chrome dev tools are going to be yeah, a lot. So that's, that's the easiest right. way to do it is what you're saying. Just Chrome dev tool. A absolutely. Network. Yeah. And, and, and Firefox has a, a, a network monitoring dev, dev stack too. Everybody's using WebKit under the covers at this point, so it's. All right. Not Firefox. Still okay, sorry. Well, Fire, but Firefox definitely has their own network monitoring tools, um, so you can watch all the calls go. The other right. thing is with this, if you set your debug level for the front end to debug, you'll actually get uh, URL, URI kind of like stuff going on. Yeah. Okay. By the way, um, because it'll actually show you the, um, like what, if it was a post and to what URI and then some of that stuff too, I believe. Yeah. Right. I would just like to be able to, if the UX is not responding, because there's so many twisty paths through the UX that you, you end up trying to do something and it's not doing what you expect. And I would love to see what it's doing under the hood so I could open a bug report or whatever. You know? Yeah, the, when a UX when the UX makes a call for pretty much any view, it's gonna it's gonna pull in multiple API calls and components and weave them together. It's it's not as yeah. not as straightforward. You, you really do need. Screen you can see them now. Where that. I just flipped all the log settings to debug, and so you can see the individual API calls that were made and how long they took, and so on and so forth. Okay. Anyways, okay. you know. Yep. Okay. That's a, I, I understand the request. I'm trying to figure out if there's a, a practical way to deliver that. Um, I, I don't think we got the. We'll go through UX stuff in a minute. All right. Um, that's cool. Okay. Hey, hey Victor. I had another another feature I, I remember seeing y'all demo internally was the uh, the command line trace piece. Oh yeah yeah. So let me uh, show that one. So in this instance, uh, we also have the ability, let's see, derp CLI, what did I call those flags? Derp CLI dash uh, T trace dash Z from the CLI uh, boot ends list. And what that does, that will tell, um, that will have uh, Derp CLI insert a couple of headers that will uh, override the logging preferences for that request round trip only. And it'll have uh, an additional, uh, it, it, it'll, that's, this is telling it to, uh, to you know, log everything at trace level and uh, throw an additional token from the CLI into all the lines that get logged so that uh, we can differentiated between any other tracing that may be going on at the time. So if I do that, it looks the same. And if I flip back over, um, you don't see anything extra here because just getting the boot ems is a, a pretty side effect free process. Um, and I don't think it shows it here. Let me get the logs. Yeah, this is, uh, the, the UX has not uh, had any specialized uh, things to let you highlight one tag yet, That's that would be something that would be an enhancement in that UI. Yeah, it looks like the tagging. Uh... 
He isn't in there. You may need to set the logging to trace, I think. Um. So, well, I, I think along this path, there's nothing to show for trace messages. Oh, could be. There's literally no trace messages. <laughs> yeah, this, path I picked this back. Is a low, yeah, low overhead operation. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. So as 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 this ver as this feature flag propagates into community more, um, we'll take feedback on how to enhance this view to make it more yeah. usable. Right now, it's it's very bare bones. Yeah, and we're we're also adding debug and trace messages kind of as we encounter problems. Right. It's kind of the new printf, except uh, unless your longer <laughs> set to be at that level, it won't uh, do any calculation to waste time. So. But we are we are hoping that when people start have you know when people have questions in the community channels, this will make it much easier for for everybody to say all right look at your logs see what's going on. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and that kind of segues into uh, the other thing that I'm on the hook to demo, which is uh, repo list installs. So mm. flip back over to the terminal so I can show you that there's nothing up my sleeve. So. What I've got running on this terminal is. Hey, uh, hey Victor, before you go, could uh, would, uh, would you mind uh, making your window just a little bit shorter, so that because you're scrolling off the bottom of my screen, I right. suspect other people might have the same the same problem. Uh, it's really hard to lower the resolution of my screen. Not not, really. not low. Just can you make the the terminal window a little bit shorter and just lift it up? Yeah, I might maybe I'm the only window. person who can't see the bottom. I think you have a height challenge to screen, Rob. I might. If you can see it, then uh, then don't worry about me. I'll just try and maximize the screen. Let's see. Yeah, actually, now I can see it fine. I just went to full screen on Zoom. Sorry. Okay, good. Let me get my terminal back the way I like it. There we go. So I've got a static web server listening for listening on a look the side uh, sledgehammer directory. And another one that's uh, on a look aside uh, CentOS 7 install directory. And what I have set up in the UX, if I go to profiles and global, I have a package repository setting. And what this has set is uh, it's what this is saying is that every time we go to look for the sledgehammer files, um, we should uh, transparently uh, proxy to this URL. And every time we go looking for the uh, CentOS 7 install files, we should transparently proxy to this URL. And so normally, whenever we go to serve files, we serve them. Um, oh, where is it? Good? There we go. Normally, whenever we serve static files of any sort, we serve them out of this directory, uh, the DR provision TFTP boot directory. And you'll notice that there is no CentOS uh, 7 by itself and no Sledgehammer in this uh, listing. Nevertheless, if I boot up a couple of uh, KVM slaves, I'll put one in Eufy mode and one in uh, legacy BIOS mode, just to show off another fix that we are, we put in. <laughs> and this is using the, the straight up uh, TNO core Eufy stuff for QEMU, so I don't know how to make it automatically boot to the network yet. Because I literally added support for this yesterday. They're both booting up. And they should wind up both booting into Sledgehammer. Oh, and this guy is done. This guy is taking its sweet time, so we'll have to figure out what's going on there. But we just flip back over to that log screen. Ooh. 
that's taking a while to load. Let's see if I crashed it. crashed yet. <laughs> that is just taking a long time to load up the logs that I want to show. By the way, let's go to machines. Oh no! The demo god struck again and I deadlocked something. It looks like alas. You pushed your lock. Hmm? You pushed your luck. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Oh, it's not even restarting properly. That's fun. Yeah, that's booting, and let's see if our thing came back. There we go. Let's see what we got for the logs now. That is deadlocking somewhere. Yep, okay, so there's a bug in the logs path somewhere. How annoying. In the log path, this is separate from the demo, separate from the redirect of content? That's what it looks like. So the idea with the with the redirect to content is that you don't you don't have to then upload an ISO. You could leave the that content somewhere else. Yeah, both of these machines that I've worked, that I booted up uh, booted into Sledgehammer, but if you look, there's no local Sledgehammer for them to have booted from on the DRP system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sledgehammer by design boots out of a uh, sledgehammer slash uh, you know uh, long hex string to identify the sledgehammer version, but that file those files just flat out don't exist in this TFTP root directory. They exist over here, and if I was able to show you my logs, you would. Uh, well, I can actually. Yeah. <sighs> And I, so if people are wondering about the use case for this, um, I can I can give some examples on, on where the use case makes is really interesting while you while you find your logs. There we go. Let's see. It's it's like Rob, if you're mirroring something already and you have the repository. That is the exact use case. Yes. Yep. Right. It, it's also really handy if you're trying to package uh, DRP into a container. 
you don't want to ship a lot of data in that container, then you, then you could be, um, you know, if so, there, there's some use cases that we're trying to enable where you pre-populate DRP directories into basically and 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 ship. So instead of using the APIs to upload new content, you could actually ship content with in a in a container. And in that case, you you really don't want all of the uh, ISO images and all the all the static stuff shipped in that container. You just want your content, um, and so that, that that's one of those cases. Or if you're running in a resource constrained environment, um, think a network switch or a Raspberry Pi, um, and you don't want those images in there, or you don't want to have to push those images out if you had a lot of copies of DRP all over your infrastructure. Um, this this is for those use cases. That's fabulous. Yep, and I can show that off a bit more. Let's go bulk actions. Uh, change these stages to my CentOS 7 install stage. Both of these, apply it. And we don't have a way to do automatic power control of the KVM virtual machines yet, so I have to reboot them the old-fashioned way. Yeah. And, and Victor, there was a question in the channel about using something like Swift to store the ISOs. Using Swift to store ISOs? Yeah, like uh, OpenStack Swift, which has a HTTP interface. I didn't actually. What is that result there? Ah, oh, cannot change state with pending tasks. What is up with that? <laughs> what are the pending tasks that it was uh, complaining about? Victor. Yeah, things are locking up too much on my system. Yeah, it does, it's okay. It, HTTP, any HTTP source for the ISOs? Uh, for the ISOs? For, uh, in this case, it's, it, does it need expanded content with a, a whole directory, or is it just a single object? Uh, you need the expanded content with the whole directory. It has to be an install tree. So you can't just point it at the, a single ISO. That ISO has to be expanded out. Right, you have to explode the ISO somewhere. Or mirror the remote repositories or whatever. Um, the important thing about all of this, let me just. Uh, so there's, there's some nuances in, how, in, in what you would use as a source. I believe you could use another DRP endpoint as a source, though. Is that a fair statement? Uh, any static, anything that serves static HTTP. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah this really. shouldn't be confused with your image-based installs, right? It's still doing kickstart-based installs. It's just looking for the actual boot images and other stuff. Yes. Um, the caveat is that um, in each of these uh, boot environments, we have a... Uh, we expect the kernel to be at a specific location, and we expect any uh, initial uh, RAM disks to be at uh, known locations relative to the root of uh, that repository. And uh, so right now, we know that on, a CentOS, that on an expanded CentOS uh, 7 install ISO, that the kernel is going to be in this directory images, pixie boot, VM linus, and the initrd that we need is images, pixie boot, and initrd.image. And um, for an install repository, we have to have the kernel in an NITRD in a known location. And that location has to be recorded as part of the boot environment that uh, you use to, the, to do the install. And so uh, for CentOS things, that's fine. For Debian things, they tend to put their, their kernel and uh, NITRDs in weird places sometimes. So. This is this is that that strange thing where we do magic to explode the ISOs behind the scenes, which you have to do anyway. But um, so we can't ma We we <laughs> the thing we're trying to do is take on the storage after the explosion from that this case effectively, right? 
so that this is all fabulous stuff. We're running close to uh, just about 20 minutes. Uh, 20 I'll stop minutes. asking questions on it then. Sorry. <laughs> so, no, they're, they're great questions. They're great things. So let's have some um, follow-up in uh, Pound community. If anyone has any additional interest in features and capabilities, obviously, as you saw through the demo, this is all very, very brand new stuff. Um, we... And getting prepped for the demo was interrupted a little bit. Uh, Victor got smacked around with doing some UEFI, uh, UEFI uh, boot change stuff in the last day and a half. Um, but we're also going to be pushing docs related around all of these things in the traditional doc location. Um, all of these features. Feedback, obviously, greatly appreciated. Uh, we also have... Um, some release notes we wanted to cover on uh, what's going into 3.6.0. And as well, we're going to cover uh, verbally with uh, Rob some uh, UI uh, features and fixes that have gone in recently and changes. Uh, we're going to have to run through all of that pretty rapidly, however, mm -hmm. since uh, we have um, uh, only 20 minutes left. And if you give me just a moment here, where's my release notes? Share screen. Uh, so hopefully you guys can see uh, the release notes. They're at traditional location in the GitHub repo. Uh, version 3.6.0 has not yet been cut, but it should be cut in the next day or two. Uh, so some of the uh, feature enhancements uh, we've seen today um, with the ISOLS installs uh, and the uh, re remote repository uh, cache uh, proxy redirection, as well as the logging system update. I had a couple uh, bugs fixed, uh, security issue with web sockets. Uh, so there's been a little bit tightening down on the web sockets event stuff to ensure that we don't have any events that are being emitted that shouldn't be consumed. Um, fixed bugs. Uh, we had a stages bug uh, with uh, export temple problems on stage changes as well. And as I just mentioned briefly, uh, Victor's been working like mad on UEFI. Uh, Greg, anything else you want to add to that? Uh, no. Um, let's see. I think we will try and look at some of these logging issues and continue testing those out before we put it out. So, um, but otherwise, I think it, there will be. Yeah, no, that's where we're at. Uh, Rob, why don't you talk a little bit about features uh, UI. on the UX? UI, UI so, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah so so for that, there there was a lot of a lot of work done, sort of clean things up. A couple of uh, longstanding feature requests went in, um, like clone of, of an object from the object page. Um, some UX things that everybody should be excited about, like rounded corners. Uh, <laughs> Version check. There's a. There's actually we split um, version checking out into its own panel um, and included all of the plugins and content because we were starting to see some. Uh, you might up. You might not realize that your content was out of date. So that we've we've tried to improve that um, functionality. You'll see that on the the check instance um, pieces. And there's a lot, a whole bunch of places where we just grow. Uh, and shrink sort of CSS, what I would call CSS improvements on how things go. Um, logging was the one we showed we showed today that they came in, um, and then we've been working to improve. I think there's an upgrade all button that made it in um, for the content. Although I, I think that's be careful if you use it um, because it can it can move a lot of content really quickly, um, and so we're going to keep tweaking on how we let people choose content and content versions. Um, uh, let's see. Um, a lot more stuff sort of behind the scenes. Oh, and the other big change was uh, we switched the login mechanism to not use the redirect. Um, so now when we log in, we log in through uh, the Amazon Cognito APIs to validate instead of redirecting you to their page and back. And that's going to let us expose um, some password updates and changes and uh, forgot my password resets. Uh, most importantly, what it does is it gives you a month-long refresh token when you log in. So if you log in once, 
you will stay logged into the system um, unless you, you push log out and destroy your credentials. Um, it will keep you logged in so you won't have to keep refreshing the user sessions. And then the same thing was done on the DRP endpoint token. It will automatically refresh those tokens if you stay connected. So um, in both cases, the idea of having to continually be recreating your tokens uh, should be should be fixed. And you can, if you have multiple endpoints, it'll get added to your list um, automatically, and then you can give them graphics and names and things like that. So um, we're trying to improve sort of this, I manage a whole bunch of endpoints experience, if that's what you're doing. Um, I know for the Rack and team, we have multiple endpoints, um, and then they get deleted, and it's always handy to clean those up and be able to delete those. So that's in the org view. Um, so there, there's, if the UX sort of breaks into two pieces. If, if you open up the, the left panel, there's a whole bunch of, of organizational things that are driven by the SAS, which are separate from the endpoint. And then um, there's a rack and feature that's enabled that actually lets you run the UX without uh, the SAS attachment. Um, it's a rack and feature uh, capability. It's not something that um, is a, it's not a public feature, um, but was a nice ad for, that went into that list for people who actually have air gapped deployments and can't use the SAS. Um, and then a ton, there's a ton of little cleanups and things like that. Shane, that was, that was about as fast as I can go. Oh, good. Thank you for taking notes. I'm trying. I'm being spotty today. Okay. Um, we're going to pass a buck over to Greg. He's going to give us a quick list of we'll be looking at um, for version 3.7. Uh, obviously, 3.6 isn't quite out the door yet, but we're already looking forward uh, to going forward uh, with new capabilities. Okay, so for 3.7, we're looking at um, an update to the plugin system. Um, if you haven't written plugins, it doesn't matter. You'll have to replace all your plugins, but It'll add the ability for the plugins to inject actions for other types of objects than just machines. You'll get um, the ability to publish events from plugins and the ability for the plugins to log into the logging system by group so that you can see and trace actions that go from the front end to the, U, to the plugin and back. Um, uh, there may be some others as we go, but um, like potentially um, API extensions and other stuff and persistence, but we're looking at that right now. Another one is versioned UX. Um, with this latest round of changes, we've kind of got our stuff in place to serve the UX potentially out of not just the GitHub pages, but out of some other like a S3 buckets as well. That way we can start doing versioned UX releases so that we can have quote a stable and then tip for people to play with new features and stuff like that. Um, that will be their next release. And then uh, Terraform. Terraform is going a under, under a, the uh, Terraform plugin, thank you, is undergoing a um, update to be more HashiCore in style. Um, and it's going to have uh, access to pretty much all of the resources that you have in DRP that are now exposed in the um, Terraform providers. So you can do things like create profiles and machines and all of that stuff from inside of a Terraform plan now. So those kind of things show up in our available. Um, yeah. So those are the three big things that are kind of, I know are coming, um, probably for three, seven. And my daughter's decided to practice clarinet now. So I heard <laughs> Tell her she's doing a fabulous job. Yeah. Sounds great. Nice background. Track. So anyway, well, I think uh, it's better than listening to my kids squabble in the background. Uh, all good things, right? Um, 
Anyway, I think that's what we've got. Um, yeah, there we go. That's the known immediacy list. All right. Um, uh, also, uh, Greg, I think I found what was causing the deadlocks. Uh, it looks like it was uh, logging in the WebSocket handler was not set to no publish, which is uh, that bad. Would that would do it. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So I'm, I'm testing that, and I'll see if that uh, takes care of my deadlocks. Sounds good. And there you have some real-time debugging and fixing on the fly during our community meetup. <laughs> We're always multitasking here. All right, so last bit of um, uh, agenda items is just opening up the floor for community feedback questions, uh, any issues you're running into, you'd like to talk to the uh, rack and team it's kind of community community hour right now so talk to us open mic so how are we making out on the custom uh, um, pre-seed thing uh, oh, that's a very good question my I have it in my tree I'm supposed to be reviewing it and making sure it's kind of ready all right cool Okay, uh, anything else from community? Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, yep. indeed. Hi, this is Dan, uh, new to the community. Uh, Welcome. Love, <laughs> love the product, uh, been a long time cobbler user, love to hate that, so uh, definitely uh, Definitely look forward to uh, seeing this product mature. Uh, one quick question for the community. Has anyone tried uh, provisioning uh, Alpine Linux hosts? Uh, Alpine? Not specifically. Um, mostly because I tend to think of it as a, uh, this is uh, you know something you would use for incredibly low footprint uh, VMs and containers. I haven't really thought of it as a thing you'd actually want to run on metal. Right, yeah. Okay. Uh, we had a Linux kit like thing that would run um, a Linux kit ISO in memory as an example, which is kind of, I think, a little similar to kind of the Alpine setup, but I'm not, I'm not fully aware in that regard. Oh, okay, all right. What are you, Stan, what, are, what what are you thinking to do with it? What's your what's your uh, use so just basically uh, managing racks of Alpine Linux uh, bare metal hosts that will basically act as Kubernetes Kubernetes clusters. Um, just managing the end-to-end -end provisioning process for that. So uh, rack and stack Pixie boot into uh, maybe in memory like um, Alpine Linux post provisioning uh, uh, and adding it to the Kubernetes cluster and then um, setting up. Um, I've been using Teleport AWX and uh, Ansible for a lot of the provisioning work that I've been working in on my uh, test environment. So just trying to close the loop on some of that workflow. Gotcha. Have, have you seen what we did with the crib work, the KRIB workflows? No, I have not seen that. Is okay. there a link? That, that might be something to check. So in that case, we're using Sledgehammer, which okay. isn't as small as Alpine, but it's pretty small um, in memory, and then uh, installing, attaching disks, installing Docker, and then running kubadmin join. Okay. And um, it pretty much does exactly what you described, just with, with CentOS instead of Alpine. Okay. Um, yeah, check, check. I think there's some links to it in the in the community channel. Um, and then that uses the DRP client to do the post provision steps using the task runner, the DRP task system, which is enough to do a join. There's, there's some other, there's some other, other fun magic uh, to actually build the cluster. Um, but that's optional. 
So Stan, is, just, is the Go uh, clients all built on? Is it possible to build them on Muzo? Instead of uh, they, yeah, they're I mean they're immutable in the sense that they have it, it's running an in-memory image. You boot you boot the image and then you that's it. And then when you want to reset, you destroy that. You just reboot. So it's it's effectively an in-memory, and you don't have to turn on SSH for it um, with the way with the way the system runs. Okay. So you can you can literally do it. You boot them, um, issue it. You get a couple of post provisioning steps, and then um, and then that's it. You're done. The system runs until you reset reboot. Okay, I'll take a look at it. on that's been posted in Pound Community also added to the uh, agenda doc here as well. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so, because my my initial like workflow was just to have teleport or do the initial like uh, Alpine Linux installation mm -hmm. with a teleport client, have it registered to the teleport cluster, and then have a dynamic inventory that basically populates uh, a AWX instance with uh, the Ansible runs to set up like the Kubernetes uh, base. Configuration and then, but I'm looking for closing the loop on the Pixie side and stuff like that. So, so so with the the crypt stuff, you could build a, a minimal DRP workflow that would literally just go. Through, it would Pixie. You'd go all the way through that workflow to join and, and be done. With okay, and there'd be no additional, no addition. You could you could attach in other systems, but you don't for what for that workflow you don't need much, and and DRP workflow is probably more than sufficient for that. You just need the join token, which is what the, the crib demo will show you the join token process. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Good question. Anything else from community? Nope. Excellent. Well, that's a wrap for the version nine of Digital Rebar Provisioned Online Meetup. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be meeting. Uh, on our version 10, and we'll get the agenda out uh, by the end of this week with additional uh, information on next meetup's agenda. Uh, great to see so many community members join us and be active. Uh, thanks to Victor for braving the wrath of the demo gods uh, with several very new and shiny and sharp pointed pieces. Uh, in the meantime, thank you everybody, and see you next time on the next online meetup.